Hey, welcome back to Tiny Hills and Off Grid Resources. This is the story of Brutus, the Stage 1 Series 3 V8 Land Rover that I saved from a fate worse than death by bringing him home and pulling him to bits and giving him the big refurb that he so richly deserved. Here's about half of my galvanised parts that have just come back from the galvanising place. And here's my mobile anti-derustification module. Yes, you're right. It's the trolley that cleaners use for cleaning motel rooms. And it's perfect for what I do. Meanwhile, in the garage, lots of nuts and bolts getting cleaned and prepared and ready for reuse. All sorted into their relevant little piles. And here's my pedal towers, refurbed, re-kitted, and ready to go. The steering columns had some love too. Galvanised brackets, fresh oil, and had its free play adjusted. Lots of other little ancillary bits and pieces painted properly this time. Sandblasted, primed and painted with an epoxy enamel. I spent a lot of time in the footwells and the entire firewalls had a big refurb, cut out lots of rust. Have a look through the previous videos and you'll see just how I handled each part of the rust repairs on this beauty. The top left hand corner the passenger side of the firewall was the worst part on the vehicle so far i've done a lot of work here on the outside but i've completely cut away the inside piece and taken it inside to work on the bench because it's in such a state now that i have most of the firewall primed i can seam seal you can see the big open gap and also here open gaps so easy for water to get in all the way up here water can just pour into these gaps sit there and cause the dreaded rust and this one well this is the club sandwich of body joins there's no less than four separate panels all spot welded together here and it's a huge rust trap because water's coming down off the screen and off the bonnet past this point and if no measures are taken to waterproof it water gets sucked into the seam by capillary action another one is this seam all the way around both fresh air vents on the front panel if you drive around with the vents open in the rain, water's going to go down that seam. Now you can see here that after priming, I've put seam sealer down all of the seams, but here I've left it open. That's so that any water that does get in can get out. I don't know whether I'm doing the right thing or not. It's just something I feel right doing. But this big seam all the way down here, And this seam here on the driver's side have now been gap filled, seam sealed, no water's getting in there, there you go, that is nice and waterproof. I use a water based seam sealer so that when I've wiped it into the gaps I can then just use a wet rag to wipe off any excess make it all nice and tidy it's a little bit slower drying than the solvent ones but I like it because it's so easy to clean up it's a little slow to go off but I'm in no hurry now this is the most complex piece of rust work that I've had to do on the bulkhead it's the top passenger corner and it was dissolved on the outside and also on the inside 
I'm doing the outside repairs first and I've cut away the entire of the inside so that I can get to the back of the outside to do these repairs. Once I've repaired all the outside, the piece that I've cut out, I'll take that into the workshop and work on it away from the car because it's quite complicated. So this is the piece that I cut out on the workshop bench. You can see where I've drilled out the spot rivets around the lip at the bottom and I've just drilled the spot rivets out of that piece that I've removed and that holds the dash top. With that gone I can now measure the angles and the size of the folds and I've marked it out onto this piece of steel. I've left it a little rusty so that I can see my marks and I'll clean it up when I'm finished. I'm going to be doing this in two stages. I'll start in the middle and work towards the outside to do the bottom and then I'll start from the middle again and work towards the outside to achieve the folds on the top. I've got sunlight streaming in through the workshop window and because of that I'm in the shade and I can't see those marks. So this little light will just help me to line it up on the folding bars and I can make the first fold which is almost 90 degrees but not quite. It's a little bit painful to watch this. Santa, if you're out there mate and you're doing deliveries this Christmas, I could do with some Land Rover t-shirts and a bench folder because I've had this pair of um, angle iron folding bars for about 30 years and I'm I'm about over it. I've sped this part up because honestly it took an hour and a half to put this these series of folds into this metal. Using the method that I use um, method I use the term loosely um, while the steel is subject to my butchering each fold that I make gets slightly damaged while I'm making the next fold. So there's a lot of remedial work. Everything has to be gone over three or four times. Whereas if Santa would bring me a proper folder, I'd be able to just fold, 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 finished. Sort of like that. Yeah. Anyway, there it is. Now I've got to weld the two pieces together and finish off the curve over a piece of pipe and then weld in the last little section that completes the panel here we go and then I've just got those two captive nuts to put into for the windscreen holding over centre tightening up thing and that piece is ready to go outside and check to see if it fits. I know it'll be close within two or three mils but I know it won't fit. I always cut just a little bit oversize and then trim it down to size on the job. This round hole at the top has to be made into a square hole so I've got these set of tiny little files and I'll just turn this round hole into a square hole so it takes the plastic plug that takes the screws that hold the dashboard on. Thankfully there's only one of these holes up here. I did have to do a couple of these down in the foot wells when I was doing my repairs there because they use the same plastic socket for the large screws to go into that hold the floor panels down. It takes five or six minutes to turn a round hole into a square hole. You just saw me create a recessed square so that the head of that uh, plastic plug doesn't sit proud and it'll match all the others. 
now I'm just going to re-weld that cage back onto it again. It's quite thin steel, so I'll get lots of clamps, hold it in place, and then I just weld through the holes where I drilled out the spot welds before. So that's almost finished. It's been a very time-consuming piece to make. I think this has taken me around four hours. I went to bed last night at about 10.30 after working on it since dark. And here it is all lined up on the inside. Lots of clamps holding it in place. Make sure it's all lined up before doing any welding. I'll start off by doing the spot welds around the vent hole and then there'll be a little bit of judicious smacking to get it into the exact place it needs to be and then I can do some more seam welding. What we're looking at here is me just preparing to do those spot welds. You can see that cavity that runs the length of the windscreen underneath the windscreen and uh, that is a bad spot for rust. There's um, no anti-rust treatment put in there from the factory. It's imperative if you have a Land Rover that you pull out either your windscreen wiper posts or your washer nozzles and you get some uh, fisheline or tectal or gold seal or any kind of rust preservative into that cavity. Now I'm using this in the foot wells. This is for stone chip protection along the bottom edge of sills on cars but I've decided to use it in the foot wells. I've done my seam sealing and over the seam sealing I'm putting this textured coat which is paintable. I'll give it a day to dry and then I can put the top coat over that and that will give me a, a lightly speckled finish in the foot wells that should be very durable. You'll notice that I'm not putting any onto the sides of the foot wells, that's because this had the deluxe trim package which included slightly more comfortable seats, a cigarette lighter and rudimentary padding in the footwells. It was uh, pretty austere but it's there and it goes down either side and I'll refit that so there's no need to paint it because it's only going to get glued and covered with a padded upholstery panel. Friday's painting day. I've got half a litre of limestone left over from doing some wheels which is just enough for me to blow over this firewall. So when I'm painting I always start off in the most awkward places down behind the engine is the hardest part I've just discovered that my gun is leaking horrendously. I've um, left my gun soaking in thinners for several weeks and the pot has actually swollen. The plastic has grown and the lid's not fitting properly. I'm dribbling paint out of the lid as soon as I tilt the gun. It's just bad, 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 bad. I'm going to have to get rid of this gun and get a new one. So I'm actually going to go and put a plastic bag over the thing to stop paint dribbling out. This is awful. Hang on, I'll be back in a minute. Well that's a little bit better. At least it's not sloshing paint out the top and dribbling it all down the back of my motor. As I say, when I'm painting, I start off in the most awkward parts first. I do all my spraying under and around and behind and up 
and then I do the easy spots. That makes sure that uh, you're not dragging your knuckles and your gun through fresh paint when you're down trying to get awkward bits done. So you do the hard stuff first. One light coat just to make it tacky. Then you can go over with a decent coat after about 10 minutes when it started to tack off. By tacking off I mean you touch the paint in an inconspicuous area with your finger and it does not come away on your finger. There's no paint residue on your finger but it's still sticky and that's the time to put the second coat on. So just one light coat over everything. Walk away and have a coffee for 10 or 15 minutes and then come back and put on the shiny coat. So you know what this means? This means that tomorrow, when the paint's dry, I can start bolting stuff back onto Brutus. All that lovely stuff that's been galvanised. All of the bulkhead um, paraphernalia, like the pedal towers, the clutch and the brake. They've all been sandblasted and refurbished and painted, a new kit through the master cylinder. Um, all that can go back on. I can refit the steering column. The front axle can go back in. Uh, the spring. Ah, oh, no, it can't. I've got to do the springs. I need to refurbish the front springs. Then the front axle can go back in. But it won't be more than three or four days, and I'll have this thing down on its wheels. And I can push it out into the yard, turn it round and wedge it back into this little gap and start working on the reason that the vehicle was taken off the road in the first place. The broken rear leaf spring. I've got some new leaf springs, well, second-hand new leaf springs off another 109. They can go in the back and I'll continue my refurbishment from the back towards the middle. And when I reach the back of the cab, I'll be able to call it finished. And hopefully that's going to be before Christmas, because I would like to take this away over the Christmas holidays. What kind of Land Rovering will you be doing over the Christmas holidays? What's the weather going to be like where you are? Are you in Britain, or the States, or are you in Africa? What's the weather like for Christmas? Drop something in the comments and let me know, and let me know if you're going to be doing anything interesting with your Land Rovers over the holidays. You know, Tiny House and Off Grid Resources isn't all about Land Rovers. I dabble into a lot of things that are to do with off-grid living, recycling, refurbishing, remaking, rebuilding, and generally saving money. So if that's the thing you're into, why not subscribe to the channel? Have a poke around, see what other videos you like.